Thanks, Lisa, for the lovely introduction. Um, so yes, I wanted to talk to you today about health in aphasia and in particular about brain health because I think this is a topic which is not always considered um, in the aphasia literature. So I wanted just to share some of the work we've been doing here at the CSAR lab. So hopefully I'll have enough time to present to you three different projects that um, I've been working on. And they're all separate projects tackling slightly different questions relating to health and to brain health. Um, but just to point out from the start, this is obviously a very collaborative effort um, and there are lots of other projects that I didn't have time to present today as well. But I'm going to start first with looking more generally at health factors in aphasia. So just to give you a little bit of background about why I'm interested in investigating these health factors, um, it's often reported in the literature that language deficits in stroke aphasia remain stable after the initial phase of spontaneous recovery. But as I'm sure a lot of you um, on this talk will know, that there's a lot of growing evidence that therapy gains are possible long into the chronic stages of aphasia. And although we've had many papers and many models trying to predict improvement, it's still not completely clear which factors are associated with language recovery, and in particular, which demographic factors and which health factors are most associated with language recovery. So in more recent years, um, some studies have reported associations between stroke age and behavioural outcomes. So individuals who are older when they have a stroke tend to have less behavioural improvement over time. <clears throat> Although it's important to note that a lot of these studies have just utilised a single time point, so it can be difficult to understand the longitudinal effect within an individual. And these results are certainly not consistent, wherein a lot of other studies find that stroke-related factors such as lesion size, lesion location, and aphasia severity initially have more predictive power than other factors such as demographic factors or health factors. And one study which did investigate the role of demographic and health factors at multiple time points was done here um, at the CSAR lab by Dr. Lisa Johnson. And she investigated um, the Wabe Q at multiple time points. So she found that a greater number of treatment hours was a significant predictor of improvement in Wabe Q. And also that increased stroke age was a significant predictor. So those who were older when they had a stroke um, had less improvement over time. And she also found an interaction between diabetes and increased exercise showing that the more days that um, someone exercised per week if they had diabetes, the more their Wabe Q improved over time. And also an interaction between diabetes and a younger stroke age. So I thought this study was particularly interesting because it modeled this improvement within the same individuals over time. So it highlighted the importance of considering some of these health factors such as diabetes, exercise and stroke age when trying to understand recovery. And there've also been some studies which have specifically investigated the role of brain health. Um, so one of these was by Varkanatsa et al, um, and that had uh, 30 individuals with aphasia, and they looked at the severity of white matter hyperintensities, which are a marker of brain health. And they found that um, the more severe white matter hyperintensities predicted a poorer response to language treatment. And this was independent of other demographic or stroke related factors such as aphasia severity, um, lesion volume, time post-stroke, age, and education. And this again demonstrates the importance of not just health factors generally, but specifically looking at brain health in aphasia recovery. But so far, there's been no big kind of comprehensive study investigating the role of these different health factors across a single treatment study. So that was exactly what we wanted to start with, really, um, to try and evaluate different potential health-related prognostic factors associated with naming improvement all within a single treatment study. So all the participants here were part, um, part of our big polar project. And most of you probably have heard about the polar project from previous talks um, at this series from our lab. But just in case you haven't seen them, I'll just briefly go through the POLAR project. So POLAR stands for Predicting Outcome of Language Rehabilitation, um, and it's a treatment study with a blinded crossover design. 
the participants were all in the chronic stage of recovery and they came in for a baseline visit where they completed um, a number of different behavioural tasks and then they were randomised to one of two treatment groups. The first was um, phonological treatment followed by semantic or it was the opposite, so semantic followed by phonological treatment. And then they had a four week rest period in between. And then participants came back for outcome assessments immediately following those therapies at one month post-therapy and six months post-therapy. And then a smaller proportion of them came back for a follow-up study one year following treatment. And there was a number of different behavioral tasks collected um, throughout the polar study. But the one that I'm going to focus on is the PNT, um, because this was collected at every time point and it was one of our main outcome measures in this study. So I've just included here a little like, diagram of when each of the PNTs were collected and the proportion of people that we had the PNT for at each time point. Um, so just for this study. So everyone had PNT1 and PNT2, and almost everyone had all the PNTs up until the sixth one. So it's 84% had up to six. And then just 40% um, have this additional seventh PNT. So the participants that I've included in this health study um, were 75 individuals um, with chronic aphasia following the left hemisphere stroke. They were all uh, a minimum of 12 months post-stroke and the exclusion criteria was no right hemisphere or cerebellar stroke and no severely limited verbal output or impaired auditory comprehension. So anyone with a WAB spontaneous um, speech rating score of zero to one or an auditory comprehension score of zero to one were, were excluded. And then just to go through a little bit more information about our participants. So for demographic variables, they had an average test age of 61 years, an average education of 15 and a half years, and there was 46 males and 29 females. And for stroke variables, um, the average stroke age was 57 years old, and there's an average of 56 months post-stroke, but there's obviously quite a lot of variation in this after the 12 months. Um, we had a good variety of different aphasia subtypes and a good distribution of aphasia severities with an average WAB AQ score of 57. And then I'll go through some of the health variables. This is obviously what I was most interested in. So 16% of our participants had diabetes and 60% reported having hypertension. And then we also calculated the Chelson comorbidity index. This includes different factors like um, myocardial infarction, dementia, liver disease, kidney disease, um, and all of these uh, risk factors are added together to give a score. So we had an average score of 3.4. And then approximately 40% reported being a current smoker. Approximately 30% have had a history of seizures. Um, and people did, on average, um, 2.8 hours of exercise per week, and about 40% reported having depression. And then finally, just some um, brain variables. So I've just included a lesion overlay map here, so we had good coverage of the left hemisphere. And then we also included information about white matter hyperintensities. So I'll just tell you a little bit more now about white matter hyperintensities. So they are um, filled with fluid and they show up as hyperintense on flare scans or on T2-weighted scans. And I've just highlighted them here with the red arrows. You can see these small dots here of, of hyperintense regions and this larger region here. And um, white matter hyperintensities are found in healthy aging, but they're also associated with cognitive decline. And we can measure the severity of white matter hyperintensities using the Fisecca scale. So for the Fisecca scale, you have two separate ratings, uh, one for the periventricular white matter hyperintensities. So as the name suggests, they're found around the edge of the ventricles. So we can rate them on a scale of zero to three, where zero means there's none. One is for caps or pencil thin linings. You can just see these small caps around the edge of the ventricles. Two is when these caps get a little larger and turn into smooth halos around the ventricles. And then three would be when it starts to extend down into the deep white matter. 
And then similarly, we can rate the deep white matter hyperintensities on the same scale of zero to three, where zero again is absent. One is just where there's these um, punctate foci, so there's just these separate dots of hyperintense region around the brain, but they're all relatively separate. And then a two, when these regions start to come together into these um, beginning confluents. And then a three, when it turns into large confluent areas, and this can cover a good chunk of the brain. And we can add these two scores together to give one summary score out of six. And it's just worth noting here that typically um, in healthy controls, if we're rating white matter hyperintensities, we'd give one rating for both hemispheres, like just one overall score. Um, because our participants all had a left hemisphere stroke, uh, we only rated the right hemisphere. So it's still just one score, but only for the right hemisphere. And that was just to account for the fact that, you know, the, we can't necessarily tell exactly where the damage is from the lesion, and some people might have more or less tissue spared in the left hemisphere. So our white matter hyperintensities, um, the average per second score was 3.2. That's a little bit about our um, participants. And just to explain a little more about what we actually did, um, so we wanted to include a variety of different health factors all into one model. So we used a linear mixed effects model um, to see which variables significantly predicted PNT improvement over time. So I've just uh, included here which variables I used in the model. So we had the Charlton comorbidity index and then hypertension, seizures and smoking. Um, and it's important to note that those three um, were binary measures. The participants got a zero if they didn't have those and a one if they did. And then we also included stroke age, the white matter hyperintensities as rated by the Fuseka scale and BMI. And then we included two interactions as well, one with diabetes and exercise and one with depression and exercise. And we tried accounting for lesion volume in a couple of different ways. Uh, one of them was by including lesion volume as a factor in this model alongside the other factors. And we also tried regressing it out of the PNT scores. Um, and in the end, both led to the same factors being significant predictors. But what I'm presenting here today is the version with lesion volume in the model, just because it makes all the results a little bit easier to conceptualize. So to start out with some information about the PNT. Um, between each individual's first PNT and their last PNT at whatever time point that was, Approximately 60% of individuals improved, around a quarter stayed the same, and approximately 15% declined. And this is just raw difference, just to give you an idea of what we're actually trying to predict here. And then I'm gonna go through all the factors and show you, um, so I'll start first at which ones were not significant predictors, just to give you an idea. Um, so we have BMI, so we just, um, plotted here the BMI along the bottom and the PNT scores on the side here. And um, smoking was also not a significant predictor. Neither was hypertension. And neither was the Charleston comorbidity index. And for the factors that were significant predictors, um, we obviously have lesion volume as we expected. So increasing um, a lesion volume was associated with poorer PNT scores. And for every 100 voxels extra that were lesioned, the PNT score reduced by approximately um, 0.03 points. This is just on average. Then we have the presence of seizures was also a significant predictor. So having seizures was associated with 48 less points on the PNT. Um, but just it's kind of important to note here that there's a lot of variability um, in this scatter plot. So I think the reason this looks like such a large effect here if this is one of those binary scores that everyone either has a zero or a one, so there's not a whole lot of variability in there. So I think that's just worth bearing in mind as we go forward. Um, like the previous literature, another significant predictor was stroke age. So for every year older the participant was, that was associated with an average reduction of 2.3 points on the PNT. And the presence of white matter hyperintensities um, was also significant. Um, so for each increased point on the Fuseca scale, that was associated with 10 points less on the PNT. But again, just important to note, there is a lot of variation across individuals. So you can see 
see some people here have a six on the uh, Prosecco scale, so that's the highest severity, but still do well on the PMT. So um, there is a lot of, of variability here. And then finally, um, I've just included hypertension again. So I've included that on both the, the not significant and the significant because it was right on the cusp. So just to give you an idea of what this looks like, um, the presence of hypertension was associated with a 27 point decrease in PNT score. And again, this was one of those binary scores, which is why the effect looks so big, I think, compared to some of the other variables. And then we also had a significant interaction with depression and exercise. So this darker purple is um, people without depression. And then this is with this lighter kind of pink color is people with depression. So without depression, uh, the more exercise someone had, the more increased the PMP scores were. And with depression, the opposite was true. And I'm still trying to understand um, this interaction, but I think it might be something to do with um, whether they're taking antidepressants or not. So in this depression group, we have a mixture of people taking antidepressants. And if we split people into three groups, so no depression, depression, and then depression plus antidepressants, um, those, those taking antidepressants most strongly have this negative relationship. And then if they're depressed but not taking antidepressants, it's kind of in between the two. So this is something to think about a little more and try and figure this out. So if anyone's got any comments about that at the end, that would be great to hear. So just to kind of summarize what I've showed you so far. So we, we did find some health factors that were predictors of naming improvement in aphasia. And that was even when including lesion information in the model. Um, and I was particularly interested in the fact that we saw the presence of white matter hyperintensities as a significant predictor. So that's suggesting that the integrity of the remaining tissue is important when we're trying to figure out who might have these um, gains and who might not. But like I mentioned, there's still a lot of variability between individuals. Um, so it might be important to consider other markers of brain health, not just white matter hyperintensities. And as in the previous literature, stroke age was also important. And I'm going to discuss that a little more in the next project. Um, but just to point out, and I, I mentioned it a couple of times, but that a limitation of this study is that our health factors were binary measures. I think future studies could try and incorporate a bit more detail. So uh, instead of just saying, did they have high blood pressure, yes or no, actually recording what the blood pressure was. I think that would be a really useful addition to the literature. So now I've kind of talked about health factors more generally. I'm going to take a little bit of a sidestep into a different way to investigate uh, health and brain health. And then hopefully I'll be able to tie it all back together in the final project. So like we said in the previous study, one of the significant factors was age. Um, and I'm sure we're all aware that age-related changes um, such as atrophy happen in the brain, but not necessarily in the same rate for everyone. So some people might have um, premature brain aging. So this is where their brain appears older than their chronological age. Um, so this might be like advanced atrophy compared to what we might expect from someone of their age. And we can estimate brain age by comparing neuroimaging measures. So looking at things like regional tissue volume and comparing one individual against like a large group of otherwise healthy individuals. And we can get a measure of premature brain aging by looking at the difference between someone's chronological age and their predicted brain age. <coughs> So some recent research suggests that premature brain aging might contribute to declining cognitive skills amongst healthy adults, and that brain age might also be related to language impairment um, following a stroke, and that might be beyond the effects of chronological age and lesion characteristics. And one thing to point out is that measuring brain age in stroke can be quite technically challenging. Um, and the main reason for this is that existing approaches to estimate brain age rely on tissue segmentation. And that in turn depends on the quality of the normalization of the scan into standard space. And this can be a little bit more tricky with lesions um, since some of the normalization approaches that we've got are usually designed to work on intact brains. So when we've got like a large lesion, there can be issues with warping. 
So one potential solution um, is to imply an enantiomorphic healing algorithm to try and mimic a healthy brain. So this process relies on the fact that generally brains are left-right symmetrical. So what it does is it takes the, the damaged um, tissue in the lesion and then it can replace it with the homologous healthy right hemisphere tissue. And this can kind of help the uh, brains to appear and within normal. Um, so it enables these normalization and segmentation approaches that have been designed for healthy controls to work well um, in individuals with large lesions. And I'll just go through this to help you walk you through it a little bit more. So I've got here two participants, um, one on the left here with a smaller lesion and one on the right with a larger lesion. And then these um, T1 scans were segmented using this enantiomorphic process to kind of heal the stroke lesion. So that would give something that looks like this. So these um, regions that had damage have been replaced um, with the homologous hemisphere. And once we've got these healed brains, um, we can use a script called the Brain Age R, which I've just put the link to the GitHub down at the bottom there. And what this um, analysis does is it segments the image and then it removes the cerebrospinal fluid and using the gray and white matter probabilistic tissues um, in a machine learning algorithm to estimate brain age. So this model was trained on over 3000 healthy individuals that were aged between 18 and 90 years old. And this is just showing you what these probabilistic tissue maps look like. So we've got the gray matter here in red and the white matter in that kind of orangey color and the CSF is in teal. So it's these um, probabilistic maps that are used in the machine learning models. So each individual be compared against this large data set of healthy individuals to try and estimate their brain age. So for each individual, we get an estimated brain age and we can use this to calculate a proportional brain age difference score. And that score is a measure of advanced brain age beyond chronological age. So the way we calculate this is by subtracting their chronological age from their estimated brain age and dividing that by their chronological age. Uh, I know it can be like a bit hard to conceptualize, so I've just given an example down here. So if we get a positive value at the end, it means that someone's brain age is older than their chronological age. So they have premature brain aging. This might be someone who is aged 50, but their brain looks similar to someone who is typically 60 years old. And then conversely, negative values show that the predicted brain age is younger than a chronological age. So that's what we're, we're all aiming for. So in this study, we also used participants from the, the big, the larger like polar study, um, but we had 93 individuals with chronic aphasia following a left hemisphere stroke. Again, they were all 12 months post-stroke at the time of enrollment, had no severely limited verbal output or auditory comprehension, and no right hemisphere or cerebellar strokes. Um, this time there was 58 males and 35 females with an average stroke age of 56 and an average test age of 61, and then an average WAB AQ score of 58-59. And the behavioral tests that we used in this study, um, we used some from baseline. So we used the WAB revised, the WACE um, MHC subtest, the pyramids and palm trees, and the Philadelphia na naming test, the PNT. And then we also used the PNT one month um, following treatment. So we had that uh, information for 78 participants. So we wanted to try two different analyses. So for the first, we used a multiple linear regression model to try and see if either proportional brain age difference, chronological age, or lesion volume could predict baseline behavior. And then we wanted to do the same, but looking at treatment gains. So for this, we used a proportion of maximal gains as the treatment outcome. So for pro proportion of maximal gains is a measure of improvement account accounting for their baseline score. So to calculate this, you subtract the pre-therapy correct items from the post-therapy and then divide that from um, correct items pre-therapy uh, subtracted from the maximum score. And again, this is a little hard to conceptualize, but I've just given some examples here. 
So if someone scored 100 pre-therapy and then after therapy scored 110, they would have a PMG score of plus 0.13. And conversely, if someone had a, a baseline score of 100 and then after therapy got worse and scored 90, they would have a PMG score of minus 0.13. So in this analysis, we wanted to use the same variables as before, but this time we wanted to try and predict the PMG score, so the treatment outcome. Um, and the only addition was that we also included the baseline score in the model too. That was correct items um, pre-therapy. So to give you some of the results, um, the estimated brain age of participants ranged from 14 years younger to 23 years older than chronological age. And the mean difference was 2.18 years. And there was a significant relationship between the participants' chronological age and their estimated brain age. This is shown here on the graph, where each of the points on the graph are relative to lesion volume. And it's also important to note that there was no significant relationship between lesion volume and um, chronological age, lesion volume and brain age, or lesion volume and proportional brain age difference. So I've just gone through each of um, the regression models now. The way I've structured it is to, um, I've written the behavior score we're trying to predict at the top and whether the model was significant. And then I've listed each of the different factors and marked them green if they were significant and red if they weren't, just to make it a little bit easier to conceptualize. So when we were trying to predict PNT scores, the higher chronological age and a larger lesion volume were significant predictors, but the proportional brain age difference wasn't. And this is the same when we were trying to predict the waste scores. So chronological age and lesion volume were significant predictors, but proportional brain age difference wasn't. But then for the pyramids and palm trees test, um, larger lesion volume and the higher proportional brain age difference were significant predictors, but chronological age wasn't. So that was, I was excited to see that. And then for the WAB, we've just created a slightly different figure as we utilized WAB AQ and some of the subscores. So we kind of wanted to show them all together. So in this figure, we're showing the variance explained for each factor. And we have in blue, the variance explained by age, in orange, the variance explained by the proportional brain age difference, and then lesion volume in gray. And all, for all of the WAB scores, they were significantly associated with all three factors, except for WAB comprehension, which was just predicted by lesion volume. And finally, looking at the therapy outcomes, um, just a reminder that we only had 78 participants for this one. So this was looking at the portion of maximal gain between baseline and one month after therapy using the PNT. So we found that just chronological age and lesion volume were significant predictors, but the proportional brain age difference wasn't. But interestingly, if we just looked at participants whose estimated brain age was either equal or higher than their chronological age. So as an example, if someone was 50, if their brain age was either 50 or higher than 50, and um, so they had premature brain aging, if we just included those, um, then larger lesion volume and a higher proportional brain age difference was significant, whereas the chronological age wasn't. And then if we included baseline performance in this model, proportional brain age difference was also a significant factor. So I know this was like a lot of different models to go through, so I just wanted to kind of summarize some of these main findings. So our results support the idea that the integrity of spared tissue is related to cognitive reserve and this capacity for therapy gains because we found that that proportional brain age difference was a significant predictor of therapy gain but importantly, that was only in those that had premature brain aging. So this lack of relationship between therapy outcomes when including participants with a younger brain age than their chronological age suggests that there are other factors influencing therapy outcomes, particularly in these otherwise healthy individuals. 
So this might be where some of the other factors that I kind of introduced earlier on, such as the amount of therapy hours someone's had, that's where those might come into play a little bit more. And one of the interesting findings was this association between proportional brain age difference and the pyramids and palm tree scores. As chronological age was not a significant predictor, but the um, brain age difference was. So it might be that premature brain aging preferentially affects an individual's ability to access semantic information. And in this study, we obviously weren't looking at the location of atrophy, but maybe future studies could investigate the location of this uh, reduced cortical integrity and premature brain aging to see how and why it might preferentially affect um, access and semantic information. And then for me, one of the main things that I took from this study was that although um, there was a positive correlation between chronological age and brain age, there was still considerable variation in brain age. Um, so if you take one, like different participants who had the same chronological age, there's a lot of variability in what their brain age might be. Um, and we know that that wasn't correlated with lesion volume, but I'd be quite interested to see what other factors might be influential. So it might be other health factors like BMI or hypertension or diabetes, that are often associated with poor brain health generally might also influ influence um, premature brain aging. So that kind of leads on to this final project that I wanted to talk to you about. So I've gone through looking at health factors in one project and brain age in another, but I wanted to finish up with this project which I've been working on recently to try and investigate the two in tandem. And this project is very much a work in progress. So I'm just going to show you some very preliminary results um, that I just got, but any suggestions or thoughts on this project would be greatly appreciated at the end. So I'm just going to take a step back for a minute. So I've talked to you about white matter hyperintensities, but um, the, in this project, I want to focus more on small vessel disease generally. So small vessel disease is quite a broad term for abnormalities relating to the small blood vessels in the brain. And it's associated with different cardiovascular risk factors. Um, so like BMI, hypertension, diabetes. Um, and some of markers of small vessel disease include these white matter hyperintensities that we've talked about, but also cerebral microbleeds, lacunes, small subcortical infarcts, and visible perivascular spaces. And the presence of small vessel disease has been associated with worse cognitive outcomes in healthy ageing. And small vessel disease is also thought to play a role in aphasia. So the volume of small vessel disease has been found to predict clinical outcome after a stroke. And some markers of small vessel disease, and in particular white matter hyperintensities, have been found to be significant risk factors for declining language abilities in aphasia. And a possible explanation for this is that small vessel disease might disproportionately affect some of these long range connections. And this might be because they're more vulnerable to injury because they need blood supply across multiple different brain regions and they have a higher metabolic demand. And that language abilities um, is a kind of complex uh, behavior so they might rely more on these long range connections. But this is not really like a straightforward relationship and there's a lot of other research out there which suggests that adding information about small vessel disease to prediction models doesn't really add any predictive value and that markers of small vessel disease don't really influence the outcomes of stroke. And it, it can be difficult to try and understand some of these contradictory results. I think that some of these differences might stem from the different behavioral tests used. So some uh, researchers are using just more general, like broad functional outcome scales, whereas others are focusing much more on specific language focused tasks. And it's possibly also the mixed approaches to detect small vessel disease. So a lot of studies rely solely on white matter hyperintensities and don't really consider the other markers of small vessel disease. Or if other markers are considered, it can be a bit inconsistent about which ones are included. So that's kind of exactly what the main aim of this project was, um, to broadly study, study the clinical impact of brain health and aphasia, but with the specific aims of using the STRIVE guidelines um, to quantify small vessel disease. So 
So those are the standards for reporting vascular changes in neuroimaging. And these were proposed back in 2013 um, by Wardlow and colleagues. So we wanted to use this um, specific set of guidelines to quantify small vessel disease and also look at the role of brain age um, in tandem with this. With the motivation that we know the integrity of the remaining brain tissue is important, so how can these factors um, combined give us a little bit more insight into recovery? So for this study, um, it was 87 participants with chronic aphasia. And these are participants that had come in um, to take part in a variety of different studies here at the aphasia lab. And the only inclusion criteria I really had, as this was a retrospective um, study, was that all participants needed to have the relevant scans that we needed to do the brain health range. So I'll go through those in more detail in a minute. So we had 30 females and 57 males with an average age of 58 and an average Wab IQ of 57. And for the method, we had four trained raters. Um, so we had two people rating each scan, and then if there was disagreement, we'd get a third rater. And the scans we were using were T1 and T2 weighted scans, flare scans, and susceptibility weighted imaging. And we had five um, measures of brain health we were interested in and taken from the STRIVE guidelines. These were the white matter hyperintensities, enlarged perivascular spaces, lacoons, small subcortical infarx, and cerebral microbleeds. So we've already discussed the white matter hyperintensities, but I'll just tell you a little bit more about some of the other measures. So the enlarged perivascular spaces are enlarged vessels which are filled with air, and they look like a little dot or a line that you can follow through multiple slices in the scan. And we identify these on the T2 scans. And similarly to white matter hyperintensities, they can be rated using a visual scale. So the scale is from zero to four, where four, uh, zero is no enlarged perivascular spaces and four is severe. And you can see how um, these increase as the scale goes up. And we rate this in different parts of the brain. So we get one score of zero to four in the basal ganglia, one in the centrum semioval, and then a binary yes or no score in the midbrain. And we can add these up to a score out of nine. And then we also looked at lacoons. So these are like round or ovoid in shape. They tend to be subcortical and little fluid filled cavities. And they're approximately three to 15 millimeters in size. And you can just see one pointed here. And then a small subcortical infarct looked very similar to a lacoon, but tend to be larger. So we just noted the presence of, of these in any of the scans. Um, and then we confirmed this uh, with a neurologist. And then finally, we looked at cerebral microbleeds. Um, so for this, we used, it, used um, susceptibility weighted imaging. And this, again, looks like little like black round dots on the scan, and this can be traced throughout the slices. So according to the STRIVE guidelines, we should use each of these measures to create a combined picture of small vessel disease. Um, in this study, we didn't look at cerebral microbleeds, or we didn't include cerebral microbleeds. Um, and the reason behind this was that only half of the participants had susceptibility weighted imaging, um, and we really wanted to increase the sample size. And also that in some of our studies, having cerebral microbleeds was an exclusion criteria. So even for the people that we did have the susceptibility weighted imaging for, there was only one individual that had um, cerebral microbleeds. So we just decided to not consider that in the study. But hopefully in future studies, we can look at this a little bit more. So we came up with a summary score following um, some previous research by Costello and colleagues, where we gave one point for mild white matter hyperintensities. So that's a score of three or four on the Fuseca scale. And two points for severe white matter hyperintensities. So that was a score of five or six on the Fuseca scale. And then one point for um, enlarged perivascular spaces, like a severe white, uh, enlarged perivascular spaces. One point for the presence of lacoons and one point for small subcortical infarcts. That led to a total small vessel disease score of up to five points. 
And then we used a very similar analysis to the brain age study. So we used a regression model, um, but this time used proportional brain age difference, the total small vessel disease score, lesion volume, and age. And we wanted to try and predict um, different behavioral scores. So the WAB AQ, the PNT, the waste matrices, and the pyramids and palm trees test. And um, again, like I mentioned, this is very preliminary results that just finished running last night. So the only um, model where the proportional brain age difference or the small vessel disease scores were significant predictors was again for the pyramids and palm trees. So they were both significant predictors, but lesion volume and age were not. So similar to the previous project, this suggests that there might be some association between premature brain aging and brain health generally, and the ability to access semantic information. Um, so future studies can maybe investigate like the spatial distribution of these premature age-related changes to try and identify the brain regions most affected and to see whether um, it is areas like um, parts of the ventral language stream and the bilateral temporal lobes that we know are related to semantic um, access to semantic information. And what was interesting to me with these very preliminary results is that age was not a significant predictor, but proportional brain age difference was, which highlights the importance of some of these newer measures of brain age. And also that if you, instead of including the total small vessel disease score, you just include the per second score. So just looking at white matter hyperintensities, which is what some of the previous literature has done, that was not significant. So this um, helps to kind of highlight the importance of incorporating other measures of brain health as well as just white matter hyperintensities. But I need to dig into these results a lot more. So just watch this space, watch this space for some uh, updates on that. Um, so just to kind of summarize everything, I kind of hope I've shown that we should try and consider health factors in our models of aphasia recovery and that future studies could maybe ask more specific health-related questions to try and understand the relationship between these health factors and recovery instead of just binary scores. Um, and I also hope that I've shown that brain age might be important in understanding recovery. So it's not just the chronological age of someone that's important, but rather the status of their brain um, and that kind of aspect of aging rather than just the chronological age. And then trying to bring it all together in these preliminary results um, showing that it might be specific tasks or specific behaviours where some of these factors are particularly relevant um, and not every task. So thank you to everyone for listening and thank you to all the collaborators. Um, as I said at the beginning, all of these um, projects were like a lot of people helped out on all of these projects and worked hard. So thank you to everyone. And thanks again to the participants and their families for taking part in these studies. Uh, welcome, any questions? Wonderful job, Natalie. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, so the chat box is open and, and you're more than welcome to submit any questions you might have. And while you're doing so, I'll go ahead and read some that have already been submitted. So the first question was from Dirk Denauden asking, I think this is in regard to the very first project that you presented on, Natalie. Um, isn't the interaction between depression and uh, isn't the interaction between depression also tainted by a likely negative correlation between these two variables in that a higher depression, higher depression is probably associated with less exercise? Yeah, and I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. And that's why I think it's interesting to consider antidepressants in that as well, because some people who are taking antidepressants might then get back to a more like healthy um, amount of exercise. So it, it is quite difficult to disentangle. And I think especially because a lot of these factors are just self-reported like self factors. So someone might say they have depression, whether we know if that's clinical depression or what the severity of that depression is as well is, is quite difficult to understand. So yeah, definitely something that needs to be explored a bit more, but I think you, I think you make a good point there, Dirk. I was thinking a very similar question to that. I'll tag on to, to Dirk's um, question in that just the motivation piece, because this was a, a study looking at more of like a treatment response, how, you know, depression is likely associated with motivation and, and one's, you know. Um, yeah, uh, Dirk yeah, yeah. also tagged on after that. Is it possible that the low impact of small vessel disease indicators on prediction of treatment response is due to the correlation with other baseline 
variables that are used in the same models. Oh, thanks, sorry. <laughs> you, you, you started out talking about some studies that showed low impact of uh, small vessel disease, right? In yes, your final yeah. study, you showed that it does have an impact, but in the previous ones, so I was wondering about the previous ones, doesn't it correlate with a lot of the other variables and therefore... Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, that, that is a big thing that it correlates with age a lot, just generally within the literature. So we know that a lot of these measures get worse as someone ages. So if you don't kind of properly account for that, I think that age could swallow up a lot of things. And until recently, there have not been these like nice rating scales for, for how to really measure white matter hyperintensities um, or any of the other, other markers as well. So and even now, using the Fiseca scale, it can be fairly subjective. Um, you know, we tried to combat that by having multiple raters rating them. How well that's controlled for in other studies might, might also be an issue. I think some of the newer studies which are using automated methods, um, such as Bianca, I think that'll be a really good step forward and that's a bit easier to quantify um, some of these and then we can maybe account for age on top of that. Yeah, sorry, Dirk. I think when you said low, I was getting confused. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Yanina Wilmsketter and Julius Fredrickson have a overlapping questions, so I'll, I'll ask Yanina's. Um, hi, Natalie, wonderful presentation. Mm -hmm. For your third project, do you think that brain age and small vessel disease correlate with each other? Yes, I think I touched on this when I was trying to answer Dirk's question. I think yes, in some cases. But the, when I looked at it briefly this morning, the only correlation that I could see was between the brain age and the enlarged perivascular spaces, um, which I think makes sense because as, as we age and the, there's more atrophy in the brain, there is like more just space in the brain, right? So some of these... Um, and like perivascular spaces, there's room for them to become enlarged. So I think that makes sense. I was surprised that there wasn't a correlation between the brain age and the Fuseca um, scores, but I, I couldn't see one yet, but I'll definitely dig into that a little bit more. Um, Brenda Rapp asks, any thoughts on why brain health factors uh, should have such selective behavioral effects, for example, only being associated with pyramids and palm trees? Um, I think it probably comes down to like the location of where um, these things occur. So I would love to go back and like look a little more. And that's hopefully what we'll do in some future projects. But we know that there's like certain brain regions where you're more likely to get white matter hyperintensities, you're more likely to get these enlarged perivascular spaces. Um, so I'm really interested in looking at which white matter tracks this overlaps with and which uh, gray matter uh, regions it overlaps with, and then that might give us an idea of which behavioral scores uh, are more likely to be affected. I'd say probably the location is the main, the main thing. And I guess as well, like, as I mentioned, it was one of Yanina's projects about how um, if, if some of these long range connections are affected, more complex behaviors that require the use of multiple brain regions in tandem might also be affected because these connections between them um, are not as good anymore. Um, Yuan Tao uh, asks, if I understood correctly, uh, the brain age measure is essentially the gray matter volume rel uh, relative to a control group. Is that correct? And if so, I'm wondering if we know whether or not, or whether and how stroke affects gray matter volume and atrophy. Yeah, this is something that I've been thinking a lot about recently, actually, because, because we do replace the damaged tissue in the left hemisphere with the right it's, I think I can think that it kind of replaces or like it heals everything, but it, it doesn't necessarily take into account that people who've had a stroke might have um, more atrophy. So I think that's definitely something to consider. Um, I think the fact that we do get a good proportion of people who have a predicted brain age of less than what their age is um, shows that it, it can't just be affected by that solely. So uh, yeah, definitely something to look into a little more. Yeah, I was thinking very similar to that too, um, and wondering if it's contralesional, you know, connections between hemispheres that could be affected from the stroke and how that's impacting right hemisphere language areas too. Yeah, yeah. Lots of um, positive responses and, and reception to your talk. Um, I think mm -hmm. one of the, uh, Brenda actually just submitted another one. So given your response that selective behavioral effects are due to the location of these factors, then shouldn't we consider these to be, quote, brain health factors as basically another form of focal damage? Yeah, and I think we can 
consider them as some form of, of focal damage. Um, I think at the minute, using these like cost for second scales, it you don't get a good sense of location um, or I guess you, you get to a broad level of severity. But I think using some of these automated methods where we can almost create basically like a lesion map, but just of white matter hyperintensity, say, and then we can use that to try and figure out um, any relationship to behavior. I think you're right. It's like basically like using it as a lesion map. Wonderful. All right. That comes to the end of what I'm seeing as questions. Um, if you, I'm sure that Natalie would be willing to receive any emails if anybody has any lingering questions, but if nobody else has any uh, other thoughts or comments, then I'll see you all in two weeks. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Busby.